All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bioc 2023's single cell session, short talks. Uh, if you have any questions for the speaker and there's time, we'll answer them at the end. If you're online, make sure you put them into the Q&A tab and our moderator will find them there and hop in. Um, also a reminder that um, there are mics hanging from the roof, so people online can kind of hear your questions if you just speak loudly. Um, but it also means that if you have any snide comments about anything, they're going to hear that too. So be aware. Um, our first speaker, uh, we'll just jump right in, uh, Dr. Zhang uh, from Abbey, a pharmaceutical company based here in the United States. Hello everyone, my name is Xu Wenzheng. I'm the principal research scientist at FV. The single cell RNA sequencing has expanded our understanding of gene expression heterogeneities within complex uh, biological section. As single cell technology becomes increasingly co-effective, experiments are generating more and more data from, from the cell. While multiple tools has developed for analyzing single cell data, their scalability is open limited. In particular, the R packages are one of the most widely used tools for exploring and analyzing single cell MSD data. But its scalability is limited by available memories and its internally data structure. For example, the number of non-zero in a sparse matrix should be less than 2 to 31. Here, I introduce a new background data package called a series of sets that extend the threads, classes, and function to support genomic data structure, GDSPY. Uh, GDSPY can store multiple dense and sparse array-based data sets in a hierarchical structure with unlimited size. It has been widely used in dual SNES, whole actron sequencing, whole genome sequencing, variant data. This new category uses a GDS-based delay matrix for data representation. The analysis of large single cell RNA-seq data remain a challenge as the data set continue growing in scale. More complex uh, computational infrastructure is required. For example, multiple tissue has been provided across different studies, representing millions of cells and hundreds of individuals. If one of the data set or the combined data set is too large for available memory. It has been suggested to use long sampling or sketching technique. The basic idea in the sketching technique is to set a subset of cell in each data set, integrate the select subset which can fit into memories, and finally propagate the integrated result back to the full data. Now we have more flexible infrastructure for single cell data. The solution can be straightforward. We can directly use a single merged data set in the analysis without worrying about the selection of representative subset and the power loss of down sampling. The downstream analysis can be done by SEO rate of set and thrust package. Here's a typical workflow using SRAS and SLRA. The count <coughs> matrix is the input of the workflow. For example, the count matrix can be generated by cell rangers from 10x genomic. The function in the SLRA package can save the sparse account matrix to a GDS file. We use the function package, SLRA.set to create a GDS based source object. 
this new source object can be saved to a load this phone and uh, object file using the standard R function. Meanwhile, the count data are stored in a GDS file separately. For downstream analysis, for example, QC, filtering, PCA, UMAT, differential gene expression, the same function then can be used since it will call the function in the new package when a Julia space source object is detected. So, Soros user can smoothly transition to using the new Julia space source object without spending too much time on learning the new package. This slide show you how the new package integrate with the backend data framework and the relationship among the package. The new package SQL.set is built on top of SQL array and strong objects. It relies on the implementation of a GDS based series matrix in the SQL array package to represent the single cell data. The new package provides a GDS based strong objects for downstream analysis. The strong object can be converted to single cell experiment objects if user prefers a single cell experiment based workflow. In the benchmarks, the conventional and the GDS based strong objects were prepared before the test. The data file size are shown in the table one. The number of cells ranks from 100,000 to 2,500,000 in the benchmark. I was not able to create a conventional strong object for more than 1 million cells. Seems that uh, the number of non zero in the count matrix is out of the limit. The GDS space file size is about four times smaller than that of the conventional source object. The test includes data loading, count data normalization, scaling, principal component analysis, and you met for dimension reduction and result saving. The corresponding R code are sold in the box. Both input and output are the R object file. The elex time and memory usage are so in the figure. Both single core and multi core performance were tested. The number of cell ranks from 100,000 to 2.5 million. Due to the memory issue, the multi core test failed for the conventional strong objects when the number of cells is larger than and equal to 500k. It also failed for single core when the number of cells is larger than 1 million. The memory uses for the thrust is more than 140 gigabytes when 1 million cells were tested. Why the new package can reduce the memory usage to 8 gigabytes, that is about 94% memory reduction. The memory usage of SRA goes almost linear with the number of cells. Uh, that's because of the memory consumption from the UMAP algorithm. As so in the figure, SRA and SRA dot have similar execution time, but SRA dot significantly reduced memory usage. The multi core performance of SRA reduced the execution time without significantly increasing the memory usage. In summary, the analysis of large single cell MSC data is a challenge in terms of scalability. A new backend data package, as Sarah said, was developed to provide large scale analysis in the thrust space workflow. It used the GDS as a file based representation for single cell count data. GDS is suited for large scale data storage and manipulation compared to thrust. The new package is significantly reduced memory usage. It can be applied to very large data sets. The SA array tutorials can be found 
at the back of the website, a list of currently supported source function is available at this link. I have tested a list of commonly used functions from the Sora version 4. Feel free to remind me if, you, if the function you want are missing or you try to use the, the beta version of Sora version 5. Finally, I'd like to thank my culture at the Genome Research Center of B. Yep. That's all. Uh, we have a question online, I'll start with. Um, how does SC array support non-invariantly parallel computation methods in Surat, like run UMAP, run PCA, and find, and find shared nearest neighbors? Um, in, in other words, they need to be all these things routines and be re-implemented, or do you have a trick to avoid that? Yeah, the question is how uh, the new packages support the function in the SRA. So you see here, there's a link here, list of supported source function. You can find the link and then we give a detail of the function. Uh, also show you which level the function can support. So, I mean, I re-implement some of the function, but not all of them. So if you are very interested in a particular function, you might email me, we can discuss how to do that. <laughs> The, the benchmarking bar plots that you were showing, what were you actually running in Surat to generate the runtimes in the memory? Like, is this um, like normalization and, or all the way up to differential expression? Or, like, I'm just wanting to get that 90% reduction. How far into Surat are you going? Uh, so, so your question is how this uh, memory, how to validate this memory reduction? Yeah, or just like a bit of like, what, what uh, steps in the Surat workflow are you running to get these runtimes? Uh, okay, so okay, here's the R code in the box. You see here, that's the R code I use for, for the benchmark. Okay. So you see the code is very simple. I did not make it very complicated. So no D, that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. No differential expression analysis, yeah. Thank you. If there's nobody else, we'll move on. Thank you again. Our next speaker is virtual. So um, give me a second here just to get them set up. <coughs> And myself a second. Um, we have uh, Dr. Kishira Geiger, I butchered that name, I'm so sorry, uh, research fellow from the University of Limerick. Uh, her talk is Comparative Analysis of Annotation Tools and Grouping Cell Types from Single, single Cell RNA Sequencing Data. Uh, I think a topic we're all interested in with all the different competing methods out there. You know, and so I'm interested to hear this one. I'm gonna mute myself and let you take over. Thank you. And am I audible? We can hear you. We can't see your slides though, so you might have to click the share your screen button. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I am Meghna Shesagar, affiliated to Limerick Digital Cancer Research Center at University of Limerick. I will be presenting my talk titled comparative analysis of annotation tools in grouping cell types from single cell RNA sequencing data. In this research work, we use popular annotation tools, single R and SCMRMA to build knowledge graphs for understanding differentially expressed genes patterns across cohorts. And we do this by analyzing single cell RNA sequencing data for gastric cancer and head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. So some of the tools that uh, that we had used uh, during conducting our work were the annotation tools that were supported from the bioconductor, the single RNSC MRMA to build um, our knowledge base. Then we used Excel and Python for storing and building the relational database for the knowledge base. 
and we um, use Neo4j for the generation of knowledge graphs. This work is an extension to our previous work, which was presented as tutorial in the ISMB monthly webinar series in the April 2023. Nowadays, we can see that uh, though there are lots of support, uh, softwares that are available for supporting um, healthcare analytics, data analytics, most of them are still um, developed in silos. And this poses a challenge to integrate information from heterogeneous sources. So the need for integrating big data in a single latent space is um, abundant. And moreover, uh, we need to uh, embed knowledge in the shared uh, latent space for um, not only for data sharing, but to bring about holistic view of the patients and um, which can be independent from the variance that, of the technologies that are being used in the practices across hospitals, pharmacies, etc. So the need for this is to, when we share data, then it can facilitate in personalized treatment recommendations and it can also help in the prognostic series stratification, which can lead to favorable. And all of this can help to design personalized treatment recommendations that can lead to favorable outcomes by understanding the, um, like we can say, by under, understanding um, all the uh, clinical, um, as well um, as all the information coming from different modalities of an individual. So uh, why we use knowledge graphs? Uh, we, uh, as a technology for our inner research, is because of uh, the advantages that knowledge graphs brings about. So they are uniform uh, structures that are um, useful for um, like representing domain knowledge. They can provide a 360 degree view of the patients by seamlessly combining modalities and heterogeneous data sources. As we can also see, researchers are using knowledge graphs for interpreting results from single cell RNA sequencing data. Nowadays, KGs are also being served as an input to graph neural networks for investigating treatment outcomes. Similarly, there are many, many use cases uh, for knowledge graphs in the bioinformatics domain. This slide is just an illustration of the diversity of use cases that can be supported by KGs. And finally, we can say that knowledge is something that is known and written down. Now let's come to our um, uh, the focus of uh, today's presentation, that is Alil. So Alil is the knowledge base that we are building. Um, and uh, it is representing data coming from heterogeneous sources, such as initially Alil um, uh, is built from the results that are being um, uh, given as an output by performing analysis on the single cell RNA sequencing data. It also incorporates information from scientific articles as well as clinical information. The tools that were used for building ANIL were single RNSC MRMA and the validation of those tools was carried out by the ability of them to discover clinically significant biomarkers. Sorry to interrupt you, we lost your slide. You're no longer sharing on our side. Okay, so, yeah. So are you able to see the screen? We can't see your screen, no. We could for the first, up until now, we've been able to see your slides. They're now, back, yep. Yeah, okay. So. The workflow for designing of Alil follows the process of getting the single cells from the uh, experimental data. And then we use the CRAD pipeline for the clustering of the cells, which was followed by the differential gene expression analysis. And then we uh, build the database through Python and um, using Excel. Uh, for, and we make this procedure automated uh, with the help of Python scripts. Similarly, Alil uses Neo4j, the graph database, which is driven by Cypher queries to extract patterns from the big data. So this slide will just give you a snapshot of the database uh, that drives Alil. 
so uh, like we said that uh, the knowledge graph uh, basically is a combination of um, hito of data coming from heterogeneous sources so it is the heterogeneous sources are not only just the results from the single cell rna sequencing experiments but they are uh, the information coming from the literatures and the information also coming from uh, the clinical information that is carried for each of the samples the data sets uh, that we used in the experimentation uh, the first data set the details of the first data set was um, the gastric cancer data set which has approximately 60000 cells and um, those are distributed across four different cohorts whereas in the second data set that we used in the experimentation was uh, for uh, was for the head and the next squamous cell carcinoma consisting of six, 63 samples of healthy versus uh, donor and having approximately 130000 cells so the uh, basis behind building ali was to extract some critical uh, insights uh, that can be uh, useful uh, for uh, for finding patterns and that can help us to um, create a digital identity for the patients so the first uh, um, the current screen the slide the first um, uh, pattern that we extracted was for the prompt list the markers that are agreed by all annotation tools so when we give the user gives this prompt then the cipher query will return the differentially expressed genes in a given cell type for example as we can see uh, the annotation tools here are represented by the color blue where uh, with the orange nose for the cell types and the pink and the purple are for the genes and the global cells respectively similarly the labels on the edges will depict the relationship between the nodes note the relation between these two ent uh, between any two entities in the knowledge graphs are always directed for example as we can see that t cells are a type of immune cells whereas cd3d is one of the genes that is identified by all of the annotation tools the next insight um, that we extracted from anil uh, from alil uh, was for um, the prompt find the differentially expressed genes in males versus females based on the filter and the cipher query was based on the filter of the log pool change and the p value for the head and the neck uh, squamous cell carcinoma um, we extracted um, the uh, insights again the first insight was for uh, seeing all the biomarkers that were agreed upon by both the single r and the scmrma annotation tools and we can uh, see um, here like uh, you will have a lots of combination of genes that were agreed on, upon between uh, both these annotation tools furthermore again uh, following the same pattern we have um, the green cells uh, for the global cell types and um, the orange cells as the subtypes of these global cells this example depicts uh, the uh, pattern uh, this can be useful for finding the uh, pattern of uh, what is the difference between the genes that are expressed in the healthy cohort as well as the versus those expressed uh, in the disease or again the data set had and the neck cancer i mean uh, squamous cell carcinoma so this is the tabular representation of the biomarkers that were described in the literature and which were obtained from the annotation tools scmrma and single r this is the result for the gastric cancer similarly we have a tabular representation of biomarkers described in the literature and obtained by the annotation tools this is for the head and the neck squamous cell carcinoma if we look at this plots for both the gastric cancer for and the head and the neck uh, cancer we can uh, so see um, the that genes that are the the blue genes the, the blue color is for the marker genes from the literature that is from all the scientific articles that we refer to and the um, genes and the different um, and the biomarkers that were able to be um, obtained from both of the tools from the scmrma and single r 
so uh, in most of the as uh, seen in this uh, plots we can see that um, single r was able to um, match up to all the uh, genes that were described in the literature these plots can be helpful even for the users who are getting started with their first experiments to um, um, as as they as it can help them to evaluate and choose the annotation tools finally to summarize our research work we created allele to represent the biomarkers discovered by the annotation tools some of the features for allele are it is dynamic and robust with the attractive option of being scalable to billions of nodes and billions of relationships across entities it can be easily reproducible with high performance computing our upcoming research will create an ensemble learner for cell to cluster assignment and allele will be extended to incorporate those results so this is just a snapshot of the ensemble learner that we are currently working upon finally allele was started with the final objective of building a digital identity for the patient uh, by combining um, um, by combining um, information um, coming across different modalities and from heterogeneous data sources so that it can help to build a personalized recommendation system for precision oncology so this research work is the first step towards attaining that goal Finally, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to my team members Gauri and Yang for their immense support in conducting this research work. I express sincere gratitude to us professors Edin Kulin and Connor Ryan for their valuable guidance, and my colleagues in LDCRC, with special mention of Michael and Maria for bringing in domain knowledge. Thank you all for your patience listening. Um, we are sadly not um, going to have time for questions. We went a little bit over with that one, but um, we had some technical issues, so I didn't want to cut you off. Um, so I am going to jump to our next speaker pretty quick. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Park, and I'm a grad student at the Van Andel Institute. And uh, for this short talk, I would like to share some of our benchmarking uh, benchmarkings of pre-processing packages uh, for SiteSeq workflow. So what is SiteSeq? Uh, SiteSeq is essentially single cell RNA sequencing augmented with ADT, uh, or antibody-derived uh, tags. It allows for simultaneous profiling of both the transcriptome and the proteome at the single cell level. And uh, it's been very, uh, it, this process involves incubating the cells with uh, this, um, with these oligonucleotide labeled uh, antibody cocktails, which act as unique barcodes for each uh, protein of interest. So uh, after the microfluidics, you lyse the cell and then you uh, do reverse transcriptase. Uh, we can co sequence the cell surface protein ADTs along with the single cell transcriptome. And as of 2023, uh, many variations of SiteSeq has been developed, each with its own uh, unique quirks and advantages. Uh, however, the common advantage that they share is that the, there's this significant improvement they bring to the classification, classification of cell types and states in complex tissues. This is especially valuable when uh, there are scenarios where the, the transcriptomes are not really uh, concordant with uh, the proteome. <clears throat> 
So uh, while Cytig is an incredibly powerful tool for characterizing samples at the single cell resolution, uh, the pre-processing of Cytig <laughs> data remains a very active research area, and there are quite a lot of uh, strategies used for pre-processing that can significantly influence the cell type annotations, differential gene expression, and uh, various other downstream analysis. And uh, the primary focus of uh, this ongoing research topic involves addressing the removal of background noise uh, in Cytique data. So given that Cytique is an antibody-based technique, it introduces a lot of substantial amount of noise into this data uh, and to illustrate, uh, consider a scenario where CD4 expression is plotted into this density plot in uh, Cytique data. Uh, we get this trimodal distribution uh, where the first peak does not really necessarily represent the real cells, so such as the monocytes or the uh, T cells on the second and the third peaks. So this high really highlights the need for effective strategies to identify and remove such a background noise, thereby ensuring the reliability and validity of uh, results obtained from uh, site-seq data. So over the past few years, multiple groups have tried to develop uh, computational packages that leverage statistical methods to estimate and eliminate these, these, these background signals, uh, really are trying to improve the rigor and reproducibility in Cytique data analysis. And several of these toolkits are publicly available and have been used within the community. And for the purpose of our discussion today, I'd like to focus on two specific methods, namely DSB and DECONT uh, Pro or DECONT X that we benchmark to see uh, how well it uh, works, as, uh, works as a workflow for our site uh, pre-processing. As a reference data set, I use the well-known PBMC data set that is uh, publicly available from Genomics 10X. Uh, and there's a lot of ample documentation and QC metrics associated with this. Additionally, I wanted to test this practicability, uh, test the practicability of these uh, packages from the perspective of a bench scientist. So I wanted to, uh, to run it on my uh, beat up 2021 laptop. So the first package that we tried was DSB, uh, short for Denoise and Scaled by Background. And DSB is essentially a package released last year with a publication on Nature Comms. And the others identify essentially two major uh, components of noise in droplet-based single cell experiments. So the first one is the protein-specific noise originating from ambient unbound antibody that has been uh, encapsulated in droplets. And DSB can correct this uh, protein-specific noise by taking into account of protein counts found in empty droplets. Essentially, the count of each protein in cell uh, containing uh, droplets are transformed by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation of that same protein across empty droplets to really uh, decontaminate. Secondly, uh, <clears throat> okay, there should be a two, but uh, <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, there's DSB is able to reveal these cell type specific noise uh, by identifying the shared variance component associated with isotype uh, antibody controls. Uh, and background protein uh, counts in each cell. So in the PBMC 5K data set that I just mentioned has three isotype controls that it was used so that we can feed it into the function. So the DSP workflow requires us to set the threshold of background versus real cell based on the protein size and the RNA size here. And I set the threshold. And uh, once we set the empty droplets, then we can run the DSP function with the isotype controls and it's worth mentioning that the DSP function also automates scaling and normalizes the data set as well. So when I plot the uh, density plot uh, for CD4 in comparison with the original matrix as red and the decontaminated as in blue, we, we notice here that we still observe the trimodality, but the peaks are more distinct, making the thresholding much more easier. Another package that uh, we try to use was Decon X that is recently updated to Decon Pro. And uh, Decon Pro also recognizes the empty droplets, but the others identified this uh, new type of artifact in the empty droplets called a spongelet, spongelet and, uh, which has just medium levels of ADT expression, but is quite distinct, different from ambient noise. So this uh, ADT expression levels in the spongelets correlate to ADT expression levels in the background. A peak of true cells in several data sets, so they uh, try to get rid of this uh, by using a Bayesian hierarchy, uh, excuse me, oh, I can't go back, Bayesian hierarchical uh, model. So in the context of DECOM Pro, it is, it's, it's, uh, I, you do require clusters for this uh, algorithm to work, 
And um, I just uh, tried to use this in uh, Vcom Pro. And um, uh, so we need to run the basic workflow of normalizing and uh, piece, uh, finding variable features, PCA clustering, and all that to run the decon to run the decon pro. And when I plot the density plot here, the background peak seems to have been parsed out with little change in the distribution of the true cells, which I found very interesting. So for 5,000 cells, this took around like two hours ish to complete the function, and uh, almost ran out of memory. So I can imagine decon pro maybe having some difficult problems to scale on a, well, a bigger data set. Um, Interestingly, my slide's not, okay. yeah, I think I pressed the wrong button. Okay, so this is just uh, uh, the side-by-side -side comparison of DECON, uh, DSP versus DECON, uh, DECON Pro, what it looks like. Overall, DSP uh, makes the DECON, uh, the background peaks more distinct, making the threshold setting more easier. DECON Pro, on the other hand, while taking longer, can parse out the background peaks from the true cells uh, with its uh, distribution relatively unchanged. And we also ventured, into cell typing packages using SiteC called SC Gate. Uh, in flow cytometry, uh, immunologists like to employ these very sophisticated gating schemes um, to identify specific cell types. And there's, here's just a rather simple, simple version of the gating set that you can import from Flojo Workspace. Um, SC Gate can simulate this gating method. And normally in single cell analysis, when you're trying to annotate cells, you have to you, you, you have these marker genes or marker uh, proteins that you can try to label clusters projected in UMAP. And SDGate is essentially an algorithm that can automate this process by with, without any training data or reference data. Uh, what's great for us was that uh, this, it, it takes into other modalities into account. So in our case, we just uh, try to use SightSeq, uh, the ADT assay. Uh, one, thing, one other important thing to mention is that this SDGate is implemented as an R package that uh, integrated that has integrated with CRET frameworks, so it's um, it can be pretty useful once you if you if you learn if you know how to use CRET. So using SC gate, we manually created a gate with positive markers for T cells and negative markers for B cells and other myeloid cells to see if it actually works. And while SC gate currently has a default gating scheme, uh, I think its annotation is currently in genes, so uh, most of the marker genes are also not really encoded in cell surface proteins. So uh, we had to manually make our own gating schemes. But uh, after we uh, set the gating threshold, we noticed that uh, it does dearly work. And we've noticed that if we project this into a UMAP, uh, the, all the, the cells that are normally uh, labeled as T cells are not completely uh, pure according to this gating scheme. So as a conclusion, um, so uh, there, here are some basic summary it takes from all these three packages that can be used for pre-processing SiteSeq data. Decon Pro has some installation changes, uh, challenges, and it's difficult to scale without HPC, but it's quite useful when we're trying to parse out background data using Bayesian hierarchical models. DSP uh, uses empty droplets, and it also uh, automates normalization, and I think it performs very best with isotype control. So if you have that in your uh, experimental setup, DSP is really nice. SCGate is basically uh, the, uh, in silico version of gating sets, and this has proven quite useful in trying to uh, annotate uh, large site data datasets. Um, yep, and I think I can move on to the acknowledgement slide. So I'd like to thank uh, Tim Trish, uh, my mentor, for this entire uh, benchmarking process, and I thank you, Ava, for helping me out through this entire presentation. Thank you, Lauren, for the uh, HPC setup, and uh, Zach as well. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker for time, but please reach out to Dr. Park on the app and um, submit some stuff uh, for any questions because I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. We're all doing a lot more site seek these days.
right, we'll introduce our final speaker of the session, uh, Dr. Zachary Bruin. Hope I'm not looking your name. He's an assistant professor of bioinformatics at Grand Valley State University, with the Department of Tropical Computing and Applied Computing Institute. His talk is Singlet, Fast, Scalable, Interpretable, and Core Analysis of Big Single Cell Data. Take it away. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to present this. Um, I'll be focusing on Singlet, but also some other R packages that are both under and over this package, uh, basically focusing on non-negative matrix factorization of single cell data. We've heard a little bit about some of this today. Uh, NMF was first popularized for single cell data um, back almost a decade ago uh, by the Alana Fairtex group at Johns Hopkins University when they published COGAPS. Uh, which was stands for coordinated gene expression across pattern sets. And basically, if you take a matrix of genes by cells uh, and you factorize it to get a low dimensional representation using non-negative matrix factorization, you get patterns, patterns that describe uh, sets of genes in sets of cells. And those are continuous weights. And so you can learn a biological process, which is a weighted set of genes in a weighted set of cells. Unfortunately, COGAPS is too slow to run on endless scale data sets. It would take months to years or more. And so we had to come up with something more scalable to work on large scale integrated models. And so we developed uh, implementation of NMF that's now published in the RCPP machine learning library, which I maintain, RCPPML, and look at the runtime in this plot. So if we look at Surat PCA for 40,000 uh, cells uh, and just take 3,000 highly variable genes, we get runtime in the purple bar for a rank 5, 10, or 25 decomposition. Now, NMF is not PCA, but I'm comparing to that because that's what everyone runs. Our NMF implementation is almost an order of magnitude faster. And also to compare to the state of the art SVD implementation implemented in IRLBA, we compare very favorably. And so we're very close to that theoretical lower bound of performance that we can achieve. So NMF runs on all genes, PCA runs on only highly variable genes. You can now use all information in your single cell assay with less compute to get the same uh, low dimensional embedding or a very uh, the similarly informative. Uh, our implementation of NMF in the left plot is faster than any other implementation of NMF made available in R. Uh, here you can see that we're two orders of magnitude faster than COGAPS, and we also are faster than R sparse, which actually is not the same algorithm, and you can't use it for single cell data. We also learn models that are just as good as these others uh, in terms of reconstruction error. Compared to Python, sklearn, we're about an order of magnitude faster, and we scale far better as the rank increases, uh, rank shown on the x-axis. Uh, and so our implementation of NMF has some theoretical and computational improvements that enable that. We currently have a CPU implementation available. We also have a GPU implementation that scales better with increasing matrix size. Uh, this should be available soon. If you use NMF, if PCA, you can use NMF. There's really no reason not to use NMF unless you have some specific linear algebra problem that you need to solve. NMF imputes missing values. PCA does not. NMF is interpretable. PCA is not. Um, and you can see that a UMAP generated from a uh, principal component embedding is about as informative as the NMF embedding. This is 100,000 PBMCs. Furthermore, when you crack open an NMF embedding, you can look at the cell weights in the embedding and average that over all cell types. So these are author annotated cell types. We can see that NMF factors 34 and 35 on the right here uh, are highly enriched for plasma cells. Unfortunately for PCA, because it's signed, uh, we cannot make that interpretable insight. Uh, and so PCA is only interpretable up to a change of sign, which is the second principal component. NMF is always interpretable. NMF also accidentally captures spatially contiguous information. So here's a 10x Visium experiment showing eight NMF factors. Uh, these factors happen to localize with known a priori information about cell type. Uh, and this, does, this NMF embedding does not incorporate spatial context. We also have graph convolutional NMF, which is absolutely uh, very fast and also works well 
uh, that will release shortly for spatial, uh, spatially aware dimension reduction. Using the annotate NMF function in our singlet package, you can easily figure out which NMF factors are associated with any um, metadata in your Surat or single cell experiment object. Um, for instance, here we map it to our annotated cell types and we can see that our factors quite cleanly uh, capture different cell type uh, information. Determining the dimensionality of a dimension reduction is difficult. Um, so we define an objective for cross-validation that minimizes bias and maximizes explained signal. By bias, I mean inability of a model to generalize to a withheld test set. And by variance, I mean explained signal um, is the error of the reconstruction of the test set. So we want to do as good of a job estimating uh, test set signal um, with our NMF model. And so here in this plot, I'm showing test set reconstruction error on the y-axis. This is a random speckled mask. And uh, you see NMF iterations on, in the colors. So as the model fits, you begin to overfit past to the right of this red line, and you underfit to the left of the red line. And right at the red line, we achieve the best test set reconstruction error at convergence. We can accelerate this the determination of the best rank using a variant of golden section search, which is implemented in Singlet so that you can quickly, often within minutes, find the best rank automatically for your NMF reduction. This method isn't perfect. It has theoretical limitations, but it's uh, fairly robust and provides you something that's tractable for exploratory data analysis. What I'm very excited about is a new data structure that we have for single cell data which capitalizes on the properties of a zero inflated negative binomial distribution. So in single cell data, we have a lot of zeros. And then we have most, most of the rest of the values are ones, followed by twos and threes and so forth. So it's very redundant. Redundancy is not exploited in CSC or COO matrices. And so we developed a new method uh, for sparse data storage that expands CSC to essentially do what I'd call a sparse sorted run length encoding. So here we have COO in the dash blue line up at one. We're looking at the size of a matrix relative to COO here. We're simulating a bunch of random matrices with different levels of redundancy. CSC always achieves about a 75% compression. However, our new formats, BCSC and IVCSC, uh, in the level of redundancy that's encountered in single cell data, achieve about 0.3 or 0.1 compression over COO. This comes at very little computational cost. So when we think about single cell analysis, we're thinking about sparse, dense matrix vector operations. Uh, for VCSC, we incur only about a 20% overhead uh, relative to Eigen's very fast sparse matrix and sparse dense blouse routine. This is a very small cost or 70% memory savings. Furthermore, for IVCSC, uh, we incur about a 4% overhead. And so just to put this in perspective, if you have a, a single cell data set that's about 15 gigabytes, it's going to take up about three to four gigabytes in core uh, with our new format. What this means is that we don't need to worry about distributing a whole bunch of algorithms for single cell analysis because we can do it in core. Basically, if you have a 1.5 terabyte HPC node, you will never, never, never need to distribute uh, with our new data structures uh, because you can always fit it in core. This is all on the C++ backend, and we're working on an R wrapper uh, to interface with DGC matrix. And uh, 0.2 or 4x slowdowns, those are our two data structure um, computational slowdowns, uh, will compare favorably against the overhead and algorithmic complexity of distributing compute. So summary of my talk, if you want to explore base NMF that's really fast and scalable, look at RCPPML, it's on CRAN and GitHub. If you want Serotin's SCE wrappers for that, go to Singlet. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for Ivy Sparse. We're going to be publishing the C++ data structure library very shortly, um, preprint soon. And we also want to get in our reference class uh, that interfaces with DGC matrix. So I'd like to acknowledge my students who've done uh, some of this work. Uh, Tim Trish, who supported me during my postdoc at Van Andel Institute when I developed the NMF implementation. 
uh, Andrew Pospisilic for uh, some funding, my HPC collaborator at GVSU, Aaron Carrier, and then uh, Chan Zuckerberg, Single Cell Data Insights for funding and uh, GVSU Presidential Innovation Fund. So thank you and I'll take any questions. We can take one question before lunch. Any hands? Any questions? Oh, we got one here. Can you say a bit more about the algorithmic improvements that are made for the NMF implementation? Can you speak to any of the algorithmic improvements you've made for the, the matrix implementation, the factorization implementation? Yeah, absolutely. So we implemented our own sparse, dense, optimized BLAS routine for non negative least squares. We use sequential coordinate descent with. Um, a bunch better branch prediction um, improvements. Uh, it's all in eigen, very low level, embarrassingly paralyzed with OpenMP. We added a scaling diagonal um, to add numerical stability so we can go float instead of double. Um, there's a couple more. Thank you kindly. And I think um, we're already a little over and everyone's waiting for their lunch uh, in the lobby. So I will let them all go, but thank you for your time. Um, and if anyone has other questions or reach in on hop in, there's a DMing thing and you can do, do all that. Thank you guys. And uh, we'll see you after lunch.